Good morning, everybody. It's lovely to welcome you to our service at Nelsey Baptist Church today. And it's really exciting because we've got a congregation. Hello, congregation. And I'm going to get it wrong because I've been told I've got to look at the camera most of the time and at you some of the time, but I'm sure I won't do that. So I apologise if you think I'm not paying you attention on the telly. Um, just a couple of notices. Please, if you're here, could you keep your masks on, if at all possible? If you're sweltering, then you can put it back on again and there are a few wires if you need to go out to the loo or anything which have been taped to the floor but just be a little bit careful if you're walking around the building I've just been on holiday and uh, to the best bit of God's creation which is the Cornish seaside and I have just been marveling at his creation and everything that he has made for our enjoyment really and um I just wanted to read you some words from one of the Psalms to start us off. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. You really see his surpassing greatness when you're being buffeted by waves in the sea. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. You can do that if you like. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with the resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're going to sing now. I regret that those of you that are here are not supposed to join in but you can sing in your heads.
praise you, Lord God, for all that you have created for us to enjoy. So much beauty around us in your wonderful world and so much variety. And it all shows us what your character is like. Loving and generous and kind and creative and wise. Praise you, Lord God, for these dear brothers and sisters met with us here today. It's so fantastic to be together to worship you. Thank you for the privilege of being part of a fellowship of believers, united in our love for you. And Lord, for those who don't feel they can come back to the building yet, I pray that they would also feel part of this fellowship of love joined together around you. Praise you, Lord God, for Jesus, our Saviour, our Redeemer, who willingly gave his life for each one of us so that we might be forgiven and put right with you. Thank you that we can be assured of your love and your forgiveness and your acceptance through Jesus. Praise you, Lord, that when we pray, you hear and you answer. And we pray now for our government, that you would enable them to be wise and principled as they navigate the future for our country. Lord, we pray for safety from COVID for our most vulnerable people. We pray for ourselves and our fellow citizens that we would be selfless, not selfish, in the coming weeks. We praise you, Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. And now Peter's going to bring our reading to us. Thank you. It's great to uh, be with you. Great to see you. Those of you who are here, it's terrific to see faces, more and more faces before us. We're going to look at John chapter 6. And uh, one of the things that we can't do for those of you who are here is hand Bibles out. So, um, but it's a very familiar passage that you'll, you'll remember. Uh, John chapter 6 and verse 25 is where we're going to start. But before, uh, while you're finding that and finding that at home, um, let me remind you that on uh, Tuesday we are planning a uh, church meeting and we're going to try and have some people here for that but also whilst also at the same time zooming in uh, to your home Uh, so uh, however you want to join that it's quite an important meeting I really encourage you to join with us if you can uh, particularly if you're a member of the church Uh, there's one or two things important things that we want to talk about and we want everybody's Uh, input. So please do uh, come along if you can uh, to that on Tuesday. So John uh, chapter 6 and verse 25. When they found him, that's Jesus, on the other side of the lake, they, the disciples, asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give us that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors at the manor in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Uh, One of the things that I want to try and do as we get gradually back into uh, church proper, if I can put it like that, and gathering together, is to to, uh, try and encourage a little discussion from time to time. So I hope you're up for this this morning. Um, So my my first kind of question is relating to names. What's in a name? What What does our name say or claim to say about us? And those of you who are sitting at home, you can join in with this as well, perhaps Uh, with the people that you're among. So, I was named Peter by my mum because just at the moment of crisis in her life when I was born, she uh, considered me, foolishly I think, but she considered me to be her rock. Okay, that's how desperate she was. But anyway, that's a whole different story. (laughs) Anybody else? What does your name mean? Do you know? Dave? Beloved. Beloved. Dave means beloved. Hailwin! sunshine thank you yeah sue princess Princess, of course i probably should have known that mike angelic Angelic. mike yeah the angel the angel michael fantastic so all of these different things um claim something and and but actually does what we're called matter does what we're called matter? So over these next few weeks during the school summer holidays, as that starts uh, this week, we're going to look at some of the things that Jesus says about himself. And in all of these, there is a very special name or, or title that he's using. And we need to remember, as we go through all of these, just how important that title is. And whenever we hear the phrase, I am, in the Bible, Uh, when we read the phrase in the Bible, we need to appreciate what Jesus is saying about himself, about his character, about his being and his person. And as as we read the New Testament today in whatever translation we use, we probably don't realize just how shocking it was for Jesus to say these things, for Jesus to use this title. But for a man... To apply the words I am to himself was absolutely outrageous, absolutely shocking. Uh, And this is something uh, that kind of gives us the background to the reason why the Pharisees, the people who were looking on at these things, get so upset with what Jesus is saying or claiming about himself. It's not so much to do with the claims of being like bread or light or whatever, but the simple words that it's so easy for us to miss. I am. Way back in the early history of God's people, Moses encounters God, doesn't he, in a burning bush encounter. And he's not unreasonably pretty startled by all that's going on. We can read about that in Exodus 3. And Moses, during this this bizarre meeting asks God for a name that he should use the appropriate way to to politely address the the king of the universe so amazingly from the middle of this burning bush God gives him a, a simple but really tricky answer I am who I am tell the Israelites that I am sent you And ever since that moment, throughout the whole of history, the Jewish people have understood that I am relates purely to the authority and even the voice only of God himself. That's how Jesus has picked up and is now using this really strange phrase. Now, we can get very clever and uh, wonder why uh, these supposedly bright Pharisees had, had, could have questioned Jesus' deity after all that they've seen, all that they've witnessed him doing, such powerful God things 
uh, that he's performed, if that's the right word. But remember, we're wise after the event. Uh, and imagine how we would feel or how we should feel if somebody just walked in here now through the open door and said, good news, everyone, I am God. I wonder how we would respond. I wonder how we should respond to such a claim. But that sense of disbelief, indignation, horror, righteous horror, is exactly what the Pharisees were experiencing. And we need to kind of get our heads around that. So against all of that background and within uh, today's passage, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And do you notice he isn't saying, I am like bread. No, he's using bread uh, as, as a picture, a picture of one of the things that he is uh, and an illustration of one of the things that he offers or the very thing that he offers to every single one of us. So Jesus stands up and tells the people, including the religious leaders and Pharisees that were gathered around and looking in to try and work out who this guy was. Jesus stands up and tells them that he is here with the authority and with the power of Almighty God. Jesus is making clear that the I am is speaking. It's only really when we appreciate that that we begin to get the, the relevance of what he says. And, uh, and what is even more vital for our understanding today is that if Jesus is claiming these things, if Jesus is, is really um, kind of in his right mind claiming these things, then we better sit up and take notice. We need to understand what he's getting at here, and we need to understand that this is so profound and so deep and so meaningful that we have to take notice. We cannot possibly ignore it. If Jesus really is the bread of life, then we need to discover what that means for us, and we have to discover what we do in response. So here's another question. I was kind of hoping that there may be some children around, so forgive me if this is a little simplistic, but boys and girls, <laughs> can you think of another Bible story where, where bread is mentioned? Come on, don't be shy. John. Feeding the 5,000. Yay! Well done. Feeding the 5,000. So just before all that we've just read, according to John chapter 6, Jesus performed this incredible miracle by the Sea of Galilee, doesn't he? He feeds a crowd of over 5,000. We're told it's 5,000 men. There would have been women and children on top of that. So well over 5,000. He feeds them from the tiny rations of a small boy's lunchbox. I always felt a bit sorry for the little boy, but anyway. So inevitably, this has caused a bit of a stir. But not, it seems, the kind of awareness or understanding that Jesus had been looking for. Look back at our passage and uh, verse, sorry, back before our passage, verse 14 of uh, John 6. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Now, Galilee at this time was a, a kind of hotbed of religious and radical extremism. The Jews hated the Romans. They were always on the lookout for a, a strong, charismatic um, king, leader, who would, who would lead them into battle to defeat this mighty enemy. Uh, and this understanding, this hope, this prayer was bolstered by passages of scripture such as uh, one we have in Deuteronomy 18. God promises to send a prophet like Moses to free his people. Now Moses had been a bit of a freedom fighter himself, so the assumption was that his successor would fight to set God's people free from bondage to Caesar. And noticing Jesus' miracles, 
uh, witnessing the excitement that followed him, uh, seeing how all that he did and all that he was kind of raised the um, hopes of the crowds that their messianic expectations were at last being fulfilled. Maybe they thought, maybe this is the prophet like Moses. Perhaps, just perhaps, this would be the time we've been waiting for. Possibly, possibly, Jesus is the one who will be literally great in battle. But Jesus has other ideas. Knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, he withdrew again to a mountain by himself. The great I am didn't want a political role. He, he didn't come to lead a violent revolution. That was never, ever the will of the Father. Rather, he came to offer something much longer lasting. Look again at verse 26. Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. What does bread do? What does bread do for us? Apart from making us fat for a moment. Some of us, sorry. I shouldn't hold out my own foibles. It, it fills us, doesn't it? It makes us full. It feeds us. It, bread is a staple food, and, and staple foods give us life and strength and energy. They sustain us. They enable us to live and to work. Without food, even a, a diet based purely on a basic food stuff like bread, we will soon fade away. But with bread, hopefully with a bit of jam on it from time to time, we're nourished, we're strengthened, we're equipped for another day. But what you've got to realize, Jesus is saying, is that there are two kinds of bread. The bread that makes our sandwiches nourishes our physical existence. But that full feeling only lasts for, well, a day or two, doesn't it? It only brings or enables temporary life. But there is a second type of bread which sustains and feeds our spiritual existence. And this is life forevermore. And the trouble with you Galileans, Jesus is saying, is that your mindset is fixed upon the first of those two options. You focus entirely on this world. Where's my next meal coming from? And those thoughts are hopelessly short term in terms of filling our stomachs and winning a temporary political battle. We may defeat the Romans, but that's only a short-term problem put off. It's not even resolved. But Jesus wants to offer something else, something much more long-term, something much more fulfilling, something permanent, something that will last forever. What Jesus wants to do is to, to raise our eyes away from our empty plates and up to a banquet in heaven and to all that, that our Father God is offering in an eternal perspective as a life which is inextricably linked to himself. He wants to give us a godly perspective of who and what God's Messiah is and can and will provide. So the people have seen this amazing miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. In fact, the, the plural of verse 26 implies that the people have seen many, many amazing miracles, but they'd still not grasped the significance, the true spiritual significance of what they had seen. You've ate the loaves. You've had your fill. You've perceived the economic benefits of what's happened. We've saved you a few quid of being able to go down to the corner shop. You've got all excited about it because I've provided food for you, but you've completely missed the spiritual significance of what has just happened. You've seen a miracle, but you didn't notice the sign of the miracle worker. The I am really is. So the implication is that when Jesus kind of looks out at the crowd 
or by the Sea of Galilee. He didn't just see a bunch of hungry bodies who needed a quick snack. He didn't see people who only needed a couple of baps from the corner shop to provide temporary satisfaction to rumbling stomachs. Instead, Jesus looked out and he saw a multitude that represented an enormous multitude of lost and hungry human beings. People who are searching in vain for satisfaction, something to to fulfill and to to sustain the, the spiritual vacuum in the depths of their hearts. And Jesus' willingness to feed them physically was just a symbol of his ability, his determination to uh, offer a much deeper spiritual need that we all have. This is a question not for you necessarily to call out an answer, but to think about who do you know who hungers for that spiritual filling as we look around our world today there are so many people aren't there who search in so many different places for meaning to life we know people we can recognize people we uh, work live shop among people who are yearning for fulfillment we have this same dilemma that the people of Jesus's day had We like the idea of a political, charismatic superstar who will find a a quick and painless answer to our economic woes and the needs of the poor. We favor somebody who has gentle hands and smooth words who will win hearts and minds without any effort on our part. But Jesus isn't interested in that. The Jesus we read of in John's Gospel doesn't offer himself as a, a temporary military or political leader for this world. Instead, Jesus wants to fulfill the spiritual starvation in our hearts for the next world. And in a world which was just as militarily insecure, just as socially divided, just as economically deprived as our own, if not more so, Jesus focused on a message that is unashamedly spiritual in its emphasis and in in its uniqueness uh, to, to be able to satisfy that longing, that hunger, that spiritual yearning forever and ever. Jesus makes clear in this passage, he came down from heaven specifically to do the works and the will of the Father. Verses 28 and 39 tell us what that will is, to lose eternally none of all those he has given me. In other words, he came to bring life, to bring eternal life, to bring permanent sustenance to all who will seek it. Living for Jesus asks first that we come to him. He stresses the need for us to to move away from our old life with its famine, its total inability to satisfy, and into all that union with God as our Father really means. People must come, not just with physical need, but bringing our entire personality, our entire being to him we bring everything and that is still still what jesus asks for today and yet it's still an obstacle in the path for many just imagine for a moment if jesus had come uh, and uh, john recorded uh, words that said that eternal life is a matter of of giving a proportion of our income to charity Just imagine how easy that would be. How many could say, yep, I can tick that box? How many people would be willing to go out and and buy that kind of insurance? If Jesus had said that eternal life was a matter of practicing uh, meditation every day, there are thousands of people who would be willing for that discipline. 
If Jesus' requirement for us was to, be, to simply be nice to one another, well, easy peasy, you are all wonderfully nice people. But Jesus said that eternal life was something we find only by coming to him with our everything, by bringing our hunger only to him and feasting on his words and his ways. We're to recognize him as the great I am and seek his righteousness. We don't need a sliced loaf or a pack of bagels to fully feed us. But we do need a meaningful, deep relationship with the living bread of life. Living as a Christian is not, it's not about asking Jesus for an occasional snack. But instead, coming wholeheartedly to him, seeking total fulfillment of life. Life in the here and now and life in all that is to follow. So to those who are hungry, to those who have that that gnawing sense of emptiness in the pit of our stomachs and the depths of our hearts, to those who realize we need good, wholesome, eternal food, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So let me leave you with one more question and ask, what difference will that make to you today? What difference does the bread of life offer to you? Let's pray. Jesus, we, uh, we enjoy our meals. We... Uh, enjoy the experience of different tastes and different textures and we enjoy the full feeling in our stomachs we enjoy the security of knowing that our shops are full uh, of provisions and that we can access them so easily but we recognize too lord the short-term nature of such filling we know that we'll be hungry again tomorrow So, Lord, please, would you open our eyes? Would you give us that greater perspective to understand that the bread of life is so much more than a sliced loaf? And as we come to you, as we feast upon you, you give us so much more than the temporary fulfillment of a good meal. You have come to do the will of the Father. The will of the Father is to invite us, to welcome us into his kingdom. Father, help us, Lord Jesus, help us to understand that by coming to you, we can know that security and that delight. Help us, Lord, to feast on you and to receive from you the eternal picnic, the eternal reality of life that you have come to fill us with. And help us too to share that. This is great news for all humankind. Help us to invite others to the banquet. For your glory we pray, amen.
Lord, thank you that you satisfy us. We don't need anything else except you, the bread of life, that you fill the parts that no other Jesus can reach. Thank you that you satisfy our souls. I don't know if you guys know but uh, our daughter lived in Jordan for a little while and um, she told us that in Middle Eastern culture bread is kind of sacred you never throw it away and it's just occurred to me that that's probably why they collect up those 12 12 basketfuls at the end of the feeding of the 5,000 because you don't throw it away she said that um, at the end of your meal when you've had enough and you don't need any more bread you put it in a bag and hang it on your front door for people to help themselves to. I had an image in my head after she'd told us this of every door that belongs to one of us having a bag on it uh, with a sign that said, help yourselves to Jesus. Because the bread of Jesus is for sharing. Uh, However, it shouldn't just be our leftovers, and that's where my analogy falls down, because actually we don't get the best bits of Jesus and then give out the dregs, as it were. Um, Life is, the the life of Jesus is life in all its fullness, and that's what we want for everybody. So I just wondered if you could go into the week with that image in your head of help yourselves to Jesus for your neighbours. How can each one of us share Jesus with those who need the satisfaction for their souls that he brings. We're going to sing our last song now. Everybody uh, sitting at home or sitting here probably needs to stand up to sing this. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Excuse me.
So good to uh, be together for those of us who are able to be and uh, just for, to be with in your homes with you as well. Let's share the words of the grace together. We're not allowed to sing until after tomorrow, hopefully, uh, but we can speak the words of the grace to one another. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Go with God's generosity into our world and go in peace. Thank you.